talking about how to be happy, and specifically, we're going to talk about contentment, which is a major part of happiness. And Paul said he had learned how to be content. Contentment isn't a state of being, it's a state of mind. Stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry emphasizing God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a series that I started two weeks ago talking about how to be happy. In the very first week I just talked about how that it's not wrong for us to be happy. As a matter of fact, I believe it's something that every person aspires to and sad to say a lot of religious people have made a disconnect between holiness and happiness. Thinking that if you are truly holy, you'll go around burdened and things like this. And I tried to use a lot of scriptures to show that happiness and joy and true rejoicing is something that is our strength. God commanded it. People were judged because they didn't serve the Lord with joyfulness and gladness of heart. So we made a case that it is not only all right for a Christian to be happy, but it is actually preferred that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And then we also just continued to talk about what makes us satisfied. And I used um, Genesis chapter 3 about Adam and Eve, how Satan actually preyed on them and made them dissatisfied with perfection, how sa uh, Satan used dissatisfaction in Jesus' disciples. They weren't satisfied with him. And we've talked about all of those things and talked about how satisfaction is something that we have to master and it's not based on how much we accumulate and how much things are going our way. It's a decision. It's a choice that we make on the inside. So that's what we've already covered. Today I want to begin to start talking about how that you have to learn to be content. Now I'm taking this from Paul's life. Paul, I believe, is a person who succeeded in this area. He said that at the very end of his life, after all of those years of ministry, he says, I have run the race. I have finished the course. And he said, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And he also said in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, when he was having a minister's conference, he said that he does all of these things so that he might finish his course with joy. And so Paul was a person who was operating in joy and happiness. And Paul tells us how this worked in his life. Look in Philippians chapter 4, and I'm going to start reading with verse 10. The book of Philippians was written from Paul while he was in prison to the Philippians. And the Philippians were a unique group of people, people that had uh, treated Paul better than most people did. And we'll be talking about some of these things. But anyway, in verse 10, Philippians 4.10, it says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Now this is Old English that I'm reading from, the King James Bible, plus I'm breaking right into the midst of the thought. And so let me just uh, fill in the blanks here. What he's talking about is when he says, Your care of me hath flourished again, uh, whereas they desired to do it more, but they lacked opportunity. It says later in this same chapter, down in verse um, 15, Philippians 4, 15, it says, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel... When I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only, for even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity. What this is talking about is that the Philippian church were the only group of people that Paul ministered to where he not only gave to them, but they gave back unto him after he left that area. Now, there were other places that when Paul was there, they would minister unto him finances and food and things like this and help him while he was there. But in a sense, that was paying for it. It's probably not the right word to use, but they were giving to support Paul's ministry directly to them. While he was with them, they helped him financially and in other ways. But the Philippians are the only group of people who gave to the Apostle Paul after he left Philippi. And when he was in Thessalonica, it says that he sent once and again unto his necessity. It's talking about twice. They gave unto him. And this verse that we just read in, in verse 10, Philippians 4.10, it says that they, uh, 
were also careful to do this more, but they lacked opportunity. This is just saying that they would have given unto him even more, but they didn't have the opportunity to do it. Of course, in those days, they didn't have the communication that we've got. Paul was in transit coming from uh, the land of Israel unto Rome. He was a prisoner and he was on ship. He got shipwrecked for a period of time. The cell phones didn't work out there. He was outside of the coverage range. They didn't know how to get hold of him, and so they couldn't really meet his uh, necessities, but they wanted to. They would have given more if they would have had opportunity. Now they had heard that he was in prison in Rome, and because of this, they were glad once again to have a way to be able to send and to help Paul financially with clothes, with uh, books and things like that. So that's what he's talking about. And then in verse 11, he says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. In other words, Paul had thanked them for the gift that they had sent and the way that they had taken care of him. And he says, but I'm not saying these things just because my physical needs have been met and satisfied. He says, I have learned to be content in whatever situation he was in. In other words, he's saying, you know what, what really blessed him was the fact that these people thought about him that they loved him and that they wanted to be a blessing to him. That's what really ministered to him. The physical things he could have done without them. He had learned to be content in whatever situation he was in. And this is the point that I'm wanting to make. The Apostle Paul was operating in victory. He wrote this letter from, uh, to the Philippians from prison and it was the most joyful letter that he recorded in Scripture right here. I mean, there are 17 times in the book of Philippians that he uses the word joy, rejoice, rejoicing, and he talks about all of these things. He was facing possible execution. He had been in prison many times, but this last time he had been in prison for two years in the land of Judea, and then he was in transit for a year and was shipwrecked during this period of time on the island of Miletus. And it, we don't know exactly how long he had been in prison in Rome at this time, but that's at least three years, maybe four years he had been in prison. And yet here's Paul rejoicing and talking about rejoicing the Lord always and again I say rejoice. Think on things that are honest, pure, lovely, the things that have good report. If there's any virtue, if there's praise, think on these things. And Paul was just glorifying God. And so he was in a very negative circumstance. And of course, his imprisonment was completely unjust. There was no justification for it. You know, if somehow or another you were being punished for something that you deserved, it might be easier to cope with that because you're thinking, well, I'm just going to take my medicine, learn my lesson, and get over this. But when you are being punished unjustly, did you know that that can really war on you? There are some of you probably watching this program that somebody has unjustly accused you and you feel that you've been misunderstood and you know exactly what I'm talking about and so you feel all of this anger and things because of that. Well, here's the Apostle Paul in a situation much, much worse than what any of us can relate to and he was facing possible execution at the whim of a dictator there was no way of knowing what this dictator would do. It just depended on how he felt that day. And yet the Apostle Paul is just rejoicing and praising God and he says that he had learned how to be content. Now I think that this is really significant and this is one of the main points that I'm wanting to make and I'm going to be talking about this all week long. That contentment is not a result of external situations. Now this is very important that you get this. Because I believe that most people today believe that contentment is a byproduct of how things are going in the physical realm. If they didn't have anybody that was coming against them, if there weren't any troubles, if there isn't any sickness, and if you've got enough things, if your finances are coming in, most people just believe that contentment would be an inevitable byproduct of circumstances. And yet the Apostle Paul is saying just the opposite, that you have to learn how to be content. It's a choice that you make. It is an acquired trait. It's not something that just comes automatically. You know, I could liken this to being able to read and write. None of us came out of our mother's womb being able to read and write. It just doesn't happen that way. You have to learn how to read and write. And it takes years and years and years of effort and you know what, really, you spend your entire life learning how to communicate better and do things like this. It's an acquired trait. 
And in the same way, contentment, which is an, a very important element in happiness, is something that you have to learn to be content. Now, I think that that is really important because most people, I don't believe, get up in the morning and just choose to be discontent. They, it's not like they just say, all right, Father, I'm believing that today I'm going to have a bad day, that I'm going to be dissatisfied, that I'm going to be upset with everything that comes my way. It's not like people just choose to go that direction, but they don't assume any responsibility for how their emotions go. They feel like that if this happens, if somebody rejects me, if somebody criticizes me, if I was to lose my job, if my mate was to tell me that they're going to divorce me, if certain things happen, I can't help it that my discontentment is just a result of these things. And so the point that I'm making is, see, they feel like they have no control. They are powerless in this area. But if you can learn to be content, then that means there is something that you can do. You can control your contentment level, which is one of the major steps towards being happy. Now, it can be done, but just like a person who just assumes that they're going to somehow or another intuitively know how to read and write, and so they don't ever go to school, they don't ever put forth any effort in this area, they're just assuming that if everything works right, they'll just automatically learn how to read and write. Well, a person with that attitude would never be able to master that. And likewise, a person who just thinks contentment is a byproduct of their circumstances is never going to be content. You have to learn. It takes effort. You have to assume responsibility and recognize that you do have the power to learn to be content. Man, that is powerful. Andrew's complete teaching titled, How to Be Happy, is available in a six-part album on tape or CD. It's also available in a DVD album recorded from television. Request album T1019 when you send a gift of 19 pounds or more to Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe. Be sure to specify tape, CD, or DVD album when you write or call. The third individual teaching in this album is also available on tape or CD we suggest a donation of three pounds. But for those unable to give, Andrew and his partners will provide this third teaching free of charge. Make your check payable to AWME. That's Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe, P.O. Box 4392, Walsall, WS1, 9AR, England. Our telephone number is 01922-473-300. Or you can go to our website at any hour. You can use credit card to make donations and receive ministry products 24 hours a day at www.awme.net. Thank you for your gift today. And now, Gospel Truth continues. So I was making the point from Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, that Paul said he had learned how to be content. And to me, that, is just, that just speaks volumes to me. You know, many people read this and just pass over and think, all right, I heard that. Let's go on to the next point. But this is such an important thing to me. You know, again, I could liken this to a lot of different things. The, these truths that we're teaching here about how to be happy, they apply in just really every area of your life. Uh, our world is saying that we don't have any power, that the reason we're the way we are is because we're just a hunk of chemicals and it depends on how these chemicals are functioning in our body. We have no choice. We have no uh, control over things. We're told that it's our environment. It's what people have done to us that has made us the jerk that we are. And so we don't assume responsibility for any of our actions. It's our dysfunctional family. It's what that woman that God gave me has done that made me do these things. I tell you, that is an attitude that is so pervasive, so prevalent in our society, and it is completely wrong. It is completely against what the Word of God teaches. Let me make a comparison here. Look at this passage of Scripture over in Titus uh, chapter 2. This is uh, Paul talking to Titus, and he's telling him what, how he's supposed to teach the older women, and it says, "...the aged women likewise that they be in behavior..." as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. 
Now there's a lot of things in these verses and I'm not going to talk about all of it. I just wanted to focus on verse 4. It says the older women are supposed to teach the younger women to be sober. The word sober here doesn't talk about not drunk. This is talking about to be serious, serious minded, not silly, foolish. And then it says to love their husbands. Now again, this is, this is the same profound point that Paul is making in Philippians chapter 4 verse 11. This says that you can teach a woman to love her husband and to love her children. Now this goes totally against everything that is taught in our society today. The movies that you see, the romance novels that you read, if you read any of these magazines about you know, marriage and how it works, basically you will, you will find this as a common thread through everything. That love is something that is um, kind of mystical. There is no way to get a handle on it. You can't control it. You fall in love. You fall out of love. We typify this by a little naked baby that we call Cupid who goes around and shoots an arrow and boom, you fall in love for a person. You fall out of love. We see all of these movies and soap operas and things where a person, you know, is happily, quote unquote, married and then all of a sudden they see a person and they don't want to be unfaithful to their mate, but they just can't help it. There's some kind of a chemistry that happened and they just fall in love and so they resist it for a while, but after a while I just, I just can't fight it. I'm in love. See, that's the attitude that most people have. That's what our world is teaching people today. No wonder we have such messed up people. I'm telling you that love is not something that comes on you like a seizure and you just, boom, it hits you or that you catch it like a cold. It is a choice that you make and you can teach yourself to love people. Boy, that's powerful. You know, I remember talking to a person from one of these countries where they arrange marriages. And this man married a girl that his parents chose for him and they paid a dowry and he married her, and they've been married for decades. And one of the statements that he made as I was talking, he says, you Americans marry the person you love. He says, we love the person we marry. And did you know that that is just anathema to Western culture and stuff because we think, oh, no, you've got to fall in love and you've got to have this thing. I'm telling you that God's kind of love is not some emotion that comes and goes and that is fickle and that is up and down. These people who say that they're so passionate and that they love each other, I mean, they can turn into hatred. They can be vicious on just the other, you know, in just the next moment. That is not the way that God's kind of love is. There is a huge difference between God's agape, true type of love, and the selfish lust that people are calling love today. Boy, I tell you, I could preach on this forever. It really gets my blood to boiling when I see some of the things. And, you know, I get on the Internet to get reports and to do things, and they always have these things up there. And they always have some kind of an entertainment news about who's in love lately and what's the greatest uh, deal going and who's broken up lately. And, and all they're reporting on is just lust. There isn't any God kind of love involved in it. And sad to say, even Christians have been duped by this into believing that that's the way that love is and it's not true. I'm telling you, just like this verse says in Titus chapter 2 verse 4, you can teach yourself to love your husband and to love your children. Not only when they are worth loving, but even when they are wrong. Love is more than just a decision, but it begins with a decision and you can choose. You can learn to love people. And I say all of that to make a comparison to help you understand that likewise you can learn to be content. That's what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. It's an acquired trait. It's something that you choose. Here's another way of saying this. That contentment is not a state of being. It's a state of mind. It's not based on circumstances. It's not based on whether everything is going your way. But rather, it's something that you choose on the inside. And you know, again... Most people don't believe this. It has not been said. This may be the very first time you've ever heard somebody talk about things like this. Uh, but it is absolutely true. 
You can get to a place that if there's sickness in your body and if you're hurting, I have met people with disabilities. I've met people that had severe handicaps and yet they just loved God. They loved people. They were happy. They were content. I remember being over in Romania and this is before the Berlin Wall came down while they were still under communist rule. I was with a family there that had had their uh, electricity turned off by Ceausescu because they were Christians. The woman had been a teacher at a university, a very prestigious job, but when she became a Christian, she was kicked out and put into some menial job. Their income decreased dramatically, and as punishment, the electricity was turned off, and they went through a Romanian winter with ice on the ceiling, the walls, and the floor, an inch thick. I mean, they nearly starved to death. Their diet was nothing but uh, bread and pig lard spread on bread. Sometimes they would fry it. Sometimes they would just eat it straight. But that's all that they ate. We brought them two sausages that were about like a foot long and two deals of cheese. And that was a year's worth of meat and cheese for them. Man, I saw suffering. They had been beaten. The man had been arrested. I saw terrible things. And yet these people were so happy. I saw the suffering that they had been through and I wanted to help them and tried to give them some money. And I remember this woman saying, you Americans, why do you think that everybody has to live like you? Says, why? Says, we're content. We're happy. They had nothing and yet they were happy. And I even offered, I said, why didn't you ever accept anybody uh, that wanted to get you out of Romania and bring you into freedom? And she says, who would stay here and minister to the Romanians if we left? Says, we love God. We're content. We're happy. Being persecuted, arrest, beaten. The daughter was literally beaten by the Communist Party uh, daughter because she had become a Christian and they made fun of her and threw stones at her and beat her up and stuff. And they had been through all of these things and yet they were talking about how happy they were, how blessed they were. Man, I've seen people that have been in marriages that most of you would have just said beyond any shadow of a doubt, get out of that marriage. I can think of one woman in particular that actually worked for me. Her husband had tried to kill her, had broken her neck, had poured hot grease over her, and yet she started receiving the word from me, and she started teaching herself to love her husband. And she loved him so much that he came at her with a butcher knife and was going to kill her, and she just started laughing. And she says, you can't touch me. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And this woman was operating in so much joy and happiness that within six months her husband got born again. And she was in a terrible situation and yet she had complete joy and peace. Contentment is not based on external things. You can be sick and still joyful. You can be poor and still joyful. You can have a bad marriage and still be joyful. It's a lie. It's a deception. When you make your contentment contingent upon external things. If you have become codependent upon health and prosperity and everybody loving you before you can have joy and contentment, then you are going to be a miserable person. Because you know what? We live in a fallen world. And even if you aren't cooperating with the devil, there's plenty of other people who are cooperating with the devil and he'll be able to march them across your path and you are going to have tribulation. You are going to have trouble in this life. And if you are waiting on everything in your life to work out before you become content, before you enter into happiness, you are going to be a very unhappy person. And I know that that's where many of you are right now. That's the reason I'm teaching on how to be happy. The rest of this week, I'm going to be talking about how you can learn contentment. And I think that this is going to be a big blessing to you. So I encourage you to join me again tomorrow for our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Andrew's complete teaching titled, How to Be Happy, is available in a six-part album on tape or CD. It's also available in a DVD album recorded from television. Request album T1019 when you send a gift of 19 pounds or more to Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe. Be sure to specify tape, CD, or DVD album when you write or call. The third individual teaching in this album is also available on tape or CD. We suggest a donation of three pounds. But for those unable to give, Andrew and his partners will provide this third teaching free of charge. 
I want to encourage you once more to please get these materials, specifically this teaching on you must learn to be content. Just like you have to learn to read and write, you have to learn to be content. And you aren't going to hear very many people say the things that it's necessary for you to be content uh, apart from circumstances. So this is something that will help you. And I, again, I say that there's not very many people teaching this. And so I believe that this would be a tremendous resource. It could help you. So please listen as our announcer gives you that information. Please get the DVD, the CDs, the cassettes or you can get this individual teaching as a gift to you. Listen and respond as our announcer gives you this information. Make your check payable to AWME. That's Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe, P.O. Box 4392, Walsall, WS1, 9AR, England. Our telephone number is 01922-473-300. Or you can go to our website at any hour. You can use credit card to make donations and receive ministry products 24 hours a day at www.awme.net. Thank you for your gift today. I want to remind you that on July the 2nd through the 6th, we're having our Summer Family Bible Conference. We call it family because we got special ministry for the youth ages 5 through 16. We've got morning and evening sessions. On July the 4th, we're going to have a special barbecue and concert. We've got a special CBC reception. If you've ever thought about coming to Bible school, we'll be there to answer your questions and show you the school. And it's just going to be a great time of praise and worship, ministry of the Word. You can actually register online and get your hotel accommodations on our website. But remember these dates, July the 2nd through the 6th. It's our Summer Family Bible Conference. A healing journey is the walk of faith we all must take in order to manifest the healing God has provided in Jesus Christ. Damon and Renee Peterson took that walk for more than a year after their son Jason developed a severe skin problem. One day as Damon was praying in tongues and watching his son play, God spoke to him, instructing him to pray for his son's heart. Within one week, all the skin symptoms disappeared. And we were just like, we have a new kid. It was amazing. And he was happy. Be sure to watch Gospel Truth in the weeks ahead as we bring you this inspiring story. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for more Gospel Truth. But I'm telling you, I'm giving a testimony that once you understand this, it's one of the most liberating things in your life not to be like a wave of the seas, the way that it's stated over in James chapter 3, that's driven with the wind and tossed. You're just up and down and you have no control. You are just riding the wave and whatever will be, will be. Que sera, sera. You know, that is bondage. That isn't freedom. You know what true freedom is? Is to choose how you're going to be. True freedom is to say that, you know, this is the person that I want to be. And there is nothing you can do to keep me from rejoicing and praising God. There is nothing that you can do to me without my consent and cooperation. I am not going to let you rent space in my mind. I am not going to let you afflict me because I can choose what I want to think on. Therefore, I can choose how my emotions go and I can choose to rejoice based on the good things that God has done regardless of what you do to me. I tell you now, that's freedom.